Uh, folks online so you know so today the three speakers we've got Ian and then we'll have Cayman uh, Reynolds the theme is sustainable apiaries so I've asked them to talk about how they they maintain their their apiaries and grow their numbers internally and and, and stay <coughs> as self-sufficient as possible uh, let's see I'm gonna close some stuff so I can actually see my screen uh just so you know uh we've had a, a big boost in new members but uh just so you know there's about 300 members now from 44 states provinces and territories so across the us and canada we've got one member from new zealand uh these are what is was uh the age of our members, 50% of people have five to 15 years, 25% are from zero to five, and then 25% 16 to 30 years. The median colonies is about seven, but we've got some folks up to over 3,000 3, colonies. Uh, we've got seven association and business members uh, as members. So this is one area that we're gonna try to push to try to get more associations in, to, to, to get regions together and talking together. We've only got one junior in students, uh, and I'm gonna make an announcement on the next slide that should help us uh, grow that. Uh, so we've grown in the last 90 days by about 151 new members. So the two for one was actually a wonderful initiative, and it's brought a lot of new blood and beekeepers into the association or society, which we needed. So some of the feedback we've been getting is uh, the current price is high and it was putting groups and people off and the two for one and just the sheer popularity of it just made it evident. I crunched the numbers. Uh, so we've uh, decided to actually reduce the rates back down to, I think it used to be $20 a few years ago. It got, it jumped from 20 to $60 for individual members. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go to a flat individual family membership at $30. We're gonna merge it with the senior membership. So it's just gonna be one uh, student. We're gonna drop it to 15. And that's for all students from basically primary school all the way to advanced research studies. And it's gonna replace what was called junior. And that's just to try to attract young people into the organization. Associations, uh, we're encouraging them to share access to a max of uh, five people uh, of their memberships, and that's to attract people business no change and benefactor what we're trying to do is to say where the money's going to go so we're hoping that if we do get benefactors 75 percent of the money will go to a research fund that melanie's working on the the setup for that right now and then 25 percent will go to speaker fees to help us pay some of our uh our speakers uh, and then just so you know, if you paid for an individual membership this year, I think there's 18 of us who paid $60. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll give you an extra year. Okay, because we're dropping the price. And there's some of us who've paid $60 this year. So uh, what we're going to do is give you an extra an extra year, just to make it fair. Uh, today's sponsor is Hive Alive. A hive Live, so number one liquid feed a supplement for honeybees worldwide, available in 40 countries. It's been fed to millions of colonies. Uh, it's the only supplement scientifically proven in multiple independent studies, uh, deliver strong colonies, increase honey production, improve bee gut health, and improve uh, overwinter survival. In addition, they've just put out a new pollen patty uh, in the US. Uh, with 15% uh, real Californian pollen and 15.5 total protein content uh, with some seaweed nutrients in there. 
uh, and it's got the full range of amino acids and trace minerals. I think they've uh, partnered with Global Patties on that. And also for US and Canada, they've got a fondant also on the market that uh, is good for overwintering and emergency feed. So thanks again for Hive Alive to sponsor our webinar fees and our tech costs. And just uh, just a quick announcement. So we've got some new directors out of British Columbia. Julia Common has joined us, which is great. Uh, for California, so uh, Daniel Weston Schoenthal, I think is the way you pronounce it. Uh, out of Oregon, Nelda Murray, Saskatchewan, Linda. I'm bad with names, I apologize. And in Washington, Jennifer Short, Dr. Jennifer Short. And actually, Idaho, we have Kenneth Rhodes also that uh, will be making the announcement very shortly. So, and uh, with uh, no further ado, so what I'll do is I'll do the quick bio for uh, Ian, and then I'll pass him the, button, the uh, presentation. So, Ian Stepler married to Sandy, father of five, farms with his family near uh, Miami, Manitoba in Canada. His family is a third generation family farm. Uh, Ian is and his family crop 3,500 acres of land, calve five to 600 head of purebred Charolais uh, cattle and manage uh, 1,200 to 1,500 uh, hives. Uh, since Ian brought his first or bought his first four hives 22 years ago, he has dedicated his life passion towards beekeeping. Ian credits his current standing of his apiary to others on whom he has leaned over the years. Big believer in paying it forward, which motivates him to share his successes and failures with others. And if you want more on Ian, uh, here's the link to his uh, YouTube channel, Canadian Beekeeper Blog. So we'll have Cayman on in a bit. So I'll just stop sharing and I'll make Ian. Uh, uh, let's see, I'll make you host. You're already a co-host there, Ian. So whenever you're ready, the show is yours. Okay, thanks for that, Etienne. Um, I just want to say uh, my boys and I are fixing up this old 1949-21 combine. And with my boy on that seat of that combine, there's going to be five generations combining on that combine. So our family has been here for a little while, um, but I'm only a first generation beekeeper. So I'm the first one who's brought bees into any part of our family. So <clears throat> I'm just kind of really new into the beekeeping world here, but I've been keeping bees for, geez, since uh, it's been 23 years now. So it, you know, it's been quite the journey. So it's quite a treat to come here and speak to you guys today. Um, what I'll do first off is I'll just try to share my screen. Just before we get going, I'll ask the panelists for now to uh, to stop their video. It'll just help with the bandwidth, if you can. Actually, if somebody wouldn't mind leaving their video on, just so I have a little bit of feeling on this screen. If someone sure. could, yeah. I have trouble uh, speaking to a cold screen, you know. <laughs> the dynamics me, of... Me of, too. Uh, yeah, dynamics of Zoom are can be very awkward so but at any rate <clears throat> um yeah so yeah uh, i'm here to talk to you guys today about maintaining the uh the battery of uh, within my operation uh, i kind of refer to the battery of my operation as my nuke my nuke um, operation uh, just trying to sustain operations moving forward right at the start of my beekeeping career I was having trouble of keeping my numbers up and static and I was always falling behind, always losing colonies, always, you know, struggling with production and getting performance I wanted out of these hives and, and I couldn't figure it out and it kind of come to me it's like oh, you do it through nuke production you keep uh, refreshing your stock you keep bringing in new stock into your operation to uh, bring the viability up. And I just want to say before I start is I'm not here to tell anybody how to beekeep. I'm just showing you a perspective of one man's beekeeping journey here and how I figured this uh, problem out. Uh, maybe to broaden your perspective, you can see how I understand my craft and maybe you can take some of that understanding back down to what you do. <clears throat> I know 
uh, like I'm up here in uh, Manitoba, Canada, or, or about 22 miles off the border uh, of North Dakota. So we're cold country up here. And I know Cayman's going to be speaking to you later on uh, in this evening. And we are completely different with our beekeeping situations. I just pulled this picture off. <clears throat> Here's Cayman. Um, this is off his YouTube channel. And he's up in his tree. This is two weeks ago. And he's blooming maple trees right now with pollen coming into his colonies. And he's got two to three to four frames of brood going on inside there. And he, and this is where I'm at right now. This is a snow bank beside my yard, beside my house. I'm just about being buried with snow just right across. And it's just, we, we all beekeep in different uh, circumstances and we, but we all manage that same insect, right? It's all the same basics. It's just, we manage those same basics, different ways to be able to achieve the circumstances we need them to per perform for us. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, my nuke production to help fight colony attrition within my operations. And my objective is to maintain colony numbers. So I want, I want the same another number of hives going, coming out of winter as they were going into winter. So I want to keep a static operation. I don't want to continually lose colonies as I go. My objective is to reinforce youth and productiveness. So every spot within my apiary is a productive spot. I don't want any place takers. Uh, my objective is to hold a reserve of nukes to also manage risk of losses during some um, uncertain times. Uh, everybody has their turn and you just got to make sure that we're able to recover when we have those uh, times of hard times. Um, my objective is also to reduce and eliminate the expenses off my ledger. That's what we all want to do. One way to do that is to stop outsourcing and kind of centralize more of that internally within your own operations. And by doing that, I recapture the cost of building these nukes. I do it through honey production. So not only do I eliminate the uh, expenses off my ledger, but I also have these nukes that I'm building um, cover costs of building those nukes. And, you know, if you have a good year, it also opens up opportunity where you can tap into further revenue uh, through nuke sales. <clears throat> so within this presentation, I'm going to show you the premise of what I'm doing. And then I'm going to show you how I've adapted it into a kind of a commercial sense. So I know Randy's here and I've kind of bastardized his uh, graph, but uh, what I'm trying to show you here is the top is where I am. Actually, the data set was created by Lloyd Harris, who is a beekeeper not too far away from me here. So this is very reflective to my certain type of uh, conditions up here where I beekeep. Down below here, I'm trying to mimic what it maybe you see for a beekeeper down in Texas. I'm on the commercial Facebook uh, forum and I'm hearing guys, you know, shaking bees already to build uh, builders to start queen rearing. And these guys are, you know, a lot of the guys will completely strip down their operations, make a whole bunch of nukes, queen cells. So they refresh their entire operation and then they move up to the northern states into the honey flow to be able to ga gather the honey crop. And it's a brilliant, absolutely brilliant strategy. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the heck can I adopt the same thing within my uh, climate, within my certain conditions here? You see these guys, it's in March. And they build these, these nukes up into colonies. And by the time they mature, they're right on time into June here, just to pounce on that flow to capitalize on that honey crop. For me up here, I'm looking like I can't start into middle May if I'm lucky. But for the last three or four years, we've been starting in June. <clears throat> and by the time we get our nukes going, it's already on the backside of the flow. And I've just lost all that opportunity honey crops. So I can't adopt their same type of strategy. And I'm like, how am I going to figure this out? What am I going to do? Because I want to try to figure this out. I want to bring nukes into my operational management. How do I do this? So what I've done is I kind of shifted from that singular type management year and evolved it into a two-year type of program. And I do it by building these nukes and treating them as my my battery, the battery of my operations. So I build these colonies out, these nukes, the best time that I can build them through June into July, maintain them through the rest of the summer into fall, set them up into these nice small little nukes, send them into winter. 
have them come out in spring and then after they come out of spring toss them straight into that honey flow right into the operation right where they're supposed to be and make me a whole bunch of money so it's all about maintaining that battery the battery of nukes that's why i hinge everything i do on right now is maintaining that battery and it's just a constant charge and then just you know decharging that into that's not the right word i for a lack of better terms, de <laughs> decharging the battery into my operation. So I'm building the charge and then releasing the charge as I go through the year. So let's say coming out of winter, fairly heavy loss, let's say 20%, whatever. So I assume my 20% loss rate out of the shed. What I do, I have my battery of nuke sitting there. I just drop two of them right in there. So I have exactly the same number of hives coming out of winter as I put in, right? So I've been able to maintain my numbers right off the mark like that. Into spring, uh, I go through and I'm a, I'm a man of assessments. So I'm always assessing my colonies. I'm always identifying colonies that are failing or something like that. And I don't like to take them as losses. I like to salvage them. So what I do is I identify those hives that are start to decrease their performance. I pull them out into my nuke production, drop a queen cell in there, get them going again, right? But then I drop my other nuke into that spot to again, hold my numbers static. Throughout the spring, through my productive colonies, I'm able to harvest a whole bunch of surplus strength. And with that, I'll be making nukes. And these will be the nukes that I will then uh, drop back into my operation, into my battery. You know, you're not gonna keep them all. So let's say out of the six I made there, I'm gonna lose one. And then I go into summer and this is when I maintain that battery. Like I kind of build that charge. And when I do that, when I'm developing up these nukes, <clears throat> growing these queens, I'm making money. So at the same time that my, <clears throat> my operation is producing honey, I'm skimming honey off these nukes at the same time, and that helps recapture some of the cost to build these nukes out. So I work these colonies pretty hard through the summer. I do assume some summertime loss because of lots of situations. Let's say I have 20% summertime loss or full-time call. I then <clears throat> slip into those nukes. And I have the same number of nukes going into winter as I had coming out of winter. So I've been able to maintain my colony numbers throughout the entire year. And as fall progresses into winter, I drop the remainder into my battery to be used the next year. <clears throat> so it's just a complete cyclical cycle of, of charging that battery and then releasing the charge of that battery into uh, my operation. So then how do I do this on a commercial scale? How can I take those 10 colonies and that premise? How can I um, manage that into a strategy within colony operations where everything's time dependent and tight schedules and manpower, all of those conditions can come together. So I'm gonna kind of show you how I do it by stepping through the year very quickly, showing you how I do it. So in the spring, <clears throat> I bring them out, forklifts, everything's on pallets, onto trucks. Um, we're not going to be taking our hives out anytime soon, but hopefully in about three weeks from now, we're going to be doing this, dropping colonies into yards, ready for spring. And right at that time is when I start to um, uh, grow these colonies out. I want to stimulate their growth. There's no natural forage out right now. There won't be for a number of weeks yet. So what I try to do is to jolt them with supplement just to get them going and get those queens laying. This is some dry supplement I have set out for them. I'm also putting patties out in the colonies and that's just to get that protein into the queen, get her laying, get that protein into the bees, get them producing jelly, get them brood rearing. And uh, <clears throat> so this is that graph that uh, Randy put together. And I just love this graph. Um, it just tells you absolutely everything you need to know about the colony throughout the entire year and help you put the pieces together. And as you notice, right along here is the brood line all the way through the year. So you got that, you know, that cycle. You have the age of the bees and you got the population in there. So it just tells you absolutely everything that's going on within your nest. 
right about this time is when I'm bringing my colonies out of the shed uh, to get them going for the year. So out of the shed, you know, say assume 20% loss out of the shed. What I'm doing is I'm dropping two of my nukes from the battery straight in there to make up losses. This is a picture of back in 19 or of 2019. Um, heavy loss that year I had 40% loss because of mites, of course. Uh, my uh, Apivar treatment wasn't working. And by the time I caught it with uh, oxalic acid vapor, uh, the damage had been done. But the oxalic kind of saved my ass. And ever since I've been using oxalic within my rotation, been able to keep my mites under control. But I have 40% loss here. And because I was actively developing nukes, creating nukes, and storing nukes as his battery, I was able to not make up all my losses here, but I was able to fill in a lot of those spots to take the edge off that loss. And that just helped me maintain the momentum I needed to be able to carry on and not have to go out and invest a lot of money to make up those losses. So I'm a man of assessment and I'm always assessing my stock. And first thing in the spring is the ideal time to assess the stock because this is the most critical period of the time when the bees are flipping from that old winter state into that new springtime state. So I'm assessing my stock within this period of time to be able to really narrow in on the viability of those queens in the colonies, just to you know try to predict what's going to go on. And I'm doing it by um, uh, tipping the colonies back and counting the frames underneath. So as you can see these here, I'd count these as four framers. This would maybe be a three frame but I'm at my count as a four. Um, and what I do is I grade the colonies with drink tags, social drink tags, <clears throat> anything that's grading an eight to 10, um, like mark as a blue tag, anything medium, the six, a four to six frame, I'll mark as a gray tag in the week or the smaller colonies I'll mark as a red so they get uh, special attention. So this is when we take them out of the shed. This is when that critical time within the year, you know, when the bees are switching themselves from that winter state into that springtime state before they start into expansion mode. And this is what I want to kind of show you to prove exactly what I'm doing through my assessments. So I'm targeting this specific time of the year when they're taking that old winter bee, turning them into springtime bees. So I'm really focusing on the assessment and viability of those queens. And by doing that, I'm able to uh, pull out all the hives that are failing and, you know, salvage those hives before I assume losses. So you see in this, uh, there's two graphs here, uh, one of the nine frame vigorous queen coming out of winter and one of a nine frame failing queen coming out of winter. Both hives set themselves up just masterfully in the fall. Um, and as you can see, the first assessment, I'm grading them both as terrific looking colonies. So they both get blue tags. So as you can see this brood line here, this is a good queen. She's escalating. This one over here, she's flat line. She's everything she's got, she's let out and she's not, she doesn't have anything left. So in about three weeks, four weeks after that initial grade, we come through and you notice this one's increased. This one hasn't. These guys are flat line. This is a hard time to find that field queen because there's so very little difference there but you better catch them the next time. <clears throat> so this one here, I'm not only going to make a big honey crop off, but I'm going to be skimming surplus bees and making a bunch of nukes. So these guys I want to spend a lot of attention towards. I want to promote them. I want to kind of foster them. I want to send these guys in and make me some money. These guys here, I identify as failing units. And what I'm going to do with these guys is I'm going to take this colony back. I'm not going to take it as a loss. I'm going to salvage this this colony, I'm going to take it out of my operation, put it into my nuke operation, kill off that queen, put it in a, a, a queen cell and refresh that colony. So I can, in a sense, you know, salvage, rejuvenate that colony. And then I'm going to put a, um, a nuke for my battery into this spot. I had a lot of trouble when I was growing my operations on calling these colonies out. Because at that time, before I was building the nukes, these were losses, right? It left an empty spot in the yard and I had nothing to fill it up. 
and I, I didn't I, every time I took one away it just kept left kept making holes all over the place and I hated that so I just you know I gave him another chance I just let him in there but if you can see this hive's not going to make me any money it's just stagnant it's going to cost me money so my strategy at that time was absolutely wrong we have to be able to focus on these colonies and pull them out before they become losses salvage them but then we got to drop in viable units so we have every single you uh, a spot within our apiary as a productive unit making us money and that is how you focus your operation on bringing the uh, the brilliance of you know bring making them work for you making them make money for you you're not always dealing with these losses you're dealing with all these colonies that are vigorous and working for you so as you can see this is colony i pulled out because it's a failed unit and i'm salvaging it then for my battery, I'm filling that spot back in. So I automatically, instantly forget about that empty spot because I filled it in. And now it's a productive colony and it's going to make me money. So on that second assessment, as we go through, after that nest has flipped itself into the springtime nest, a box full of young bees, right? We're going through and we're tipping these colonies back and we're identifying, we're doing exactly what we, I showed you in that graph. We're just kind of, uh, we're, we're assessing the colony's vigor uh, and we're identifying the failed ones, but we're also focusing on the ones that are uh, needing attention and we need to promote this growth. So these colonies you tip back, we're looking at eight to 10 framers, they automatically get a second box. And I put a second box up on top, I call my split boxes and I set them up very specifically. I set them up with two foundations on each side and honey and four empty frames in the center. <clears throat> and I'm taking advantage of the queen's natural uh, instinct to stovepipe. Those bees will go straight up. They'll clean up those frames and that queen will be hot on their tails and she'll be laying eggs in those frames within days. And she'll fill those four frames <clears throat> of uh, empty frames up. That's exactly what I wanna take off as a split. And I call that my surplus strength. So then I come through, I take off that split and I use this strength to make up nukes. So right after the expansion, <clears throat> or right after the turnover, we get into the expansion mode of the colonies and we get into the swarm season. So this is what I call a beekeeper's job. This is our reason, this is why we're here. This is our purpose in life is to manage our colonies, to avoid the swarming instinct, to be able to replicate these colonies off and build these colonies into honey production units. Right in the center of this, swarm season is where I'm going to be taking my split. So as I show here, we're salvaging our split off our, new, our, off our colonies to build a whole bunch of nukes. I'll start my split or I'll start grafting when the hives tell me. So it's kind of like what I was showing you earlier on. You have those guys down in Texas and they're already starting to rear queens because their colonies are ready for it. They have drones, they have bees, they have brood, they have everything they need. I'm in a snowbank up here. I can't do anything until I get into spring, which is going to be May. And when do I start in May? Well, I let the bees tell me when to start and that's when I start seeing drones walking around. So if you take a whole bunch of assumptions here and you put it together on a graph, it tells you exactly when is the best time to make these nukes up. And that's the time I wanna to target to be able to develop out these queens and make these nukes is the best opportune time to do it. If I press the boundaries and do it up in April, I might not have enough mature, sexually mature drones to be able to handle the workload, let alone all the, uh, the weather that we'll have to manage at that time. So I look here, I'm looking June, looks like a really good time to make queens. I can push that back into May a little bit. So right, that is the time I'm gonna be focusing making these, uh, these nukes. And this is when I start making my builders up. Um, I uh, do things the way I like to do things. And uh, I set my builders up uh, very specifically. And I do it perpetually queenless. I don't deal with any type of colony manipulation whatsoever other than just 10 pounds of bulk young bees. I find 10 pounds is my magic number and uh, continual rotation of uh, cap brood, like the brood that's purple eyed or later. So they're gonna be emerging right away. 
and maybe a shake or two of bees uh, on a weekly rotation. And I'm just going to quickly go through my queen process here just because I like to talk about it, but I won't get into detail. I have a separate presentation on this, but what, I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take the least amount of resource from my operations to build myself the maximum amount of queens. And the way I do that is I run my builders in a, ten in a four day graft frame rotation. So every four days, the builder gets a new uh, start. Every frame is a 30, fr uh, 30 cell start. And one of the reasons why I do this is not only to maximize the uh, production of these builders, but it also to, I, I feel that it keeps these builders in a constant state of jelly production. These, these young bees are creating the jelly and they're continually building out cells all the time. They're not stop, start, stop, start. They're always building out cells. And I just think it makes for uh, better use of the bees I have in those boxes. So every day I get 30 cells. So day one, day two, day three, day four, I'm back on the first one. So if, you know, if I need 60 cells every day, I just replicate that process. If I need uh, 90 cells, I just have another row. So everything's uh, set up in a system so I can duplicate it depending on how much, uh, how many cells I need to uh, be available when I make my splits. So I put my first frame in the first day, and when I come back on the fourth day, that frame I put in here, I slide over, I drop it in. So I have that next start. And then I start my rotation again. Here's Carrie in the, uh, in the builder yard. We have two rows going here. Uh, she's just going in to drop uh, another graft frame into this builder right here. So then on that four day rotation, when I transfer that um, frame over the fourth day, I come back the, on the eighth day, that frame gets transferred out of those builders and into my incubator. And this works very well. This incubator just allowed me to tighten up my, uh, my whole cyclical process there into like an eight day uh, period. Uh, you know, as anybody who rears queens know that bees <clears throat> work on uh, a very um, cumbersome uh, calendar. So what this incubator has done is allowed me to compress everything into a very predictable management cycle. And it also allowed me when we're transferring our, we have to, I have to appreciate that when we're transferring on day eight, the cells are very vulnerable. So I don't handle them. Carrie does because she has a, a woman's touch. You know, she's very gentle and she loves every queen cell she puts in here. <clears throat> but by using this incubator also has helped even out my emergence. So these queen cells mature almost exactly all at the same time. You look inside the builder and you look at the dynamics of that cluster and the temperature within that cluster varies from the center out to the outside. So the outside ones usually mature just a little bit later than the ones inside just because of temperature. You put them in on day eight, you put them into a very steady, a consistent temperature. They all mature at the exactly the same time. And it's just a beautiful thing when you're putting into nukes. For me, I'm putting it in at 93 and a half degrees. I know guys at 94, some at 92 and a half, which I think is a little cool. Um, and uh, trying to keep the humidity up as high as I can. He's here at Carrie, she's grafting. She doesn't like grafting. I don't know how to graft. You know, I'm good with hammers. Carrie's good with grafting tools, right? <laughs> so I stick with what I'm, what I'm good at and that's swinging hammers. So Carrie goes and she uh, does all my grafting and she grafts in her truck. She has this little, a tray on her steering wheel so she uh, has a radio cranked and you know her air conditioning and she's actually no she doesn't have air conditioning she um, has wet towels draped all over her truck to bring up the humidity inside the truck and then she cranks the heat so that she's trying to target the ideal temperature and conditions to be able to make these grafts and they, you know I'll hop in there she's see how she's doing and she's just cooking but what she's doing is working because she's getting 9900% graft takes all the time. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? And that's what I want to see after 48 hours of graft is beautifully drawn cells, consistent. You know, I'm not going to be calling out any of these. 
I use these little tools just to help with counting as we go and follow her cards. So when she's doing our, all of her work, she tracks it on these cards and these cards and follow that frame into slot A into slot B then, and then into the incubator. Then from the incubator, we take it out to the nukes and mark the information down on the nuke cards. This also helps communication between Carrie and I because I'm out in the B yards doing my work and she's back grafting. At the end of the day, if we don't meet up, I can go to the yard and see what she's doing and not have to interrogate her for an hour and a half to figure out what's going on every day. So this just helps that fluid line of communication without having to talk to each other all the time. Day 10, we transfer them out, day 11 hot, and day 12, look out because they start to hatch. And just beautiful queens, I tell you. And I, I always figure a sign of a good queen rear is one that has surplus queens all the time looking to have to sell. And, you know, Carrie hates pinching off cell, uh, queen cells, but I tell her, if you're doing your job right, we're going to be pinching off some queens because we just don't have enough space for them all. So it's a sad day when she has to pinch a queen, but, you know, that's how, that's how the business goes. I like to transfer my carry case up here. It's cool sometimes, or most of the time. So we carry our cells into these cases and it plugs into the cigarette lighter and it keeps the cells nice and warm so we can drop them into our nukes. Our mating yards, we have a lot of pasture. Pastures make great mating yards. You see this yard in the background? The nukes that I'm mating here will be mating with the drones from the queens I produced last year but not necessarily from this yard here. They tell me these drones, when they go at their congregating site, if they fly, let's say within a half hour span, they spend as little time as they can flying and more of their time holding, waiting for the queen. Whereas the queen will spend more time of her flying and less time in those holding, the, you know, mate pop, 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 and then she'll be flying back. So I think it's 10 minutes to a mile or something like that. So they'll try to fly a mile away to mate. But I always like to keep uh, drones handy just in case it's too windy or the conditions are not favorable. So she can just go slip up into this congregating site fairly close and get made. And it shouldn't matter anyways, because there should be no relation between this and what's going on over there. But uh, I wonder how far those queens get away sometimes because those, those drones can be quite aggressive sometimes. You can see them just flying around. But at any rate, I sat them, sat them down into the mating yards and um, once I drop the queen cell on there, we'll check back in about a day just to make sure it's emerged. And if it has, we leave them absolutely alone for 20 days. And we got to be fairly swift um, because we have a honey flow right up on our heels. Uh, but, you know, sometimes queens take their time. I had an old German beekeeper tell me one time, as he said, Ian, you got to realize these are German bees and German bees take their time. So I used to rush them at 18 days, but I find that if I leave them to about 22 days, I actually get, you know, quite a better success rate with leaving a bit longer. But after that, I mean, I got to drop the hammer sometime. So after that, we just shake them out. It's nice when I can set them, I have these easy loaders. So I just stock the nukes on pallets, set them out, drop cells. And this VR is a 95 or 99% to success and it's nice when you can just pick them back up and put them on the truck and take them out to the yards. It's the way it's supposed to be. So throughout this period of time, we've developed out these nukes and now we're gonna start making money on them. We capture some cost. And what I, the, the way I do that is I share space. I, I take these nukes and I put them on the backside of the flow. So after, uh, we get through all the production colonies, then we proceed through the nukes and pull whatever honey they can give that they can provide for us. And we use the same equipment as we do with the retrial operation just to keep everything standardized and easy to uh, manage. And the way I do that is by merging my colonies together, have them work together just so they're using that same standardized box. And that way I'm not pissing around with a whole bunch of these little nuke boxes all over the place. Um, the secret is not to let those queens through. Like those bees will merge very easily. I used to merge the nukes with newspaper and I used to spray them with honeybee healthy to get them. Now I don't waste my time with that whatsoever. If there's a little bit, even just a little bit of flow going on, I just stack the boxes on top. But we got to make sure that the queens don't meet. And I learned the hard way not to use plastic excluders because plastic excluders warp. 
So we use um, metal bound queen excluders to keep the two units separated from each other. We also manage our drift uh, because we have them all on pallets like this. Drift is an issue. So we alternate the entrances and that absolutely eliminates all that problem. I, we, I've talked to some beekeepers who run six ways, like six nukes pointing one way, six the other. So the, all the entrances are the same way. And those bees will fly from the inside to the outside colonies and leave them with just a tiny wee nest in the center because of drift. But when I alternate the entrances like this, there is absolutely no issue with it whatsoever. <clears throat> and I run them into the honey flow. Sometimes you get their timing right and you get to those light flows and they can bring a lot of money in for you. So this is a nuke yard I have in one of our canola fields we had to resow because of bugs. So this is pushing into August. So on the backside of the typical flow, just a few timely rains. And this yard, like this is, I produce twice of what you see here, <clears throat> 40 pounds in every one of these boxes. So these nukes are producing 250 up to 350 pounds per stack and it's just absolutely incredible. So, you know, the opportunities there. So you just stack the deck to be able to take that opportunity and capitalize on it every time you can. But you gotta be careful. I mean, I set these guys up. I thought it was a little bit small, <clears throat> but those young queens, they can really spark up. And then before you know it, they have six frames of brood going on down below. And when that six frames of brood emerge, pow, those bees, they need space. I was, you know, probably five days too late here. They had this, these two boxes absolutely plugged full of honey. This honey crop is just, or the canola crop is just finishing off there. I should have had another two boxes on top of these guys for sure. So just because they look small when you first set them up and put the boxes over top of them, you got to check back because these, these colonies will just ignite and you got to make sure you have enough space for them. So in the fall, after the honey flow, <clears throat> I assume a lot of uh, summertime, I don't assume a lot, but I do assume summertime losses. Um, we use a skateboard, sometimes queens get through excluders. Uh, we work fast through the yards. Uh, so we maybe we damage some colonies, cause some uh, losses and just, you know, typical swarming and not requeening. All these situations come together to form summertime losses and which we usually weed out in the fall as our fall time calls. And we take those units and we've run at a time at this time of year, so we can't salvage these. So we just take the units. If they don't show a viable colony going on, we just shake them out in the grass. They merge with another colony. But right at that time is when I take some of those nukes I just produced and drop them into those spots, just to make sure that I have the same amount of hives going into winter as I'd coming out. So through the summer, let's say I have a 20% uh, loss zip. I just fill them straight in and it just completely erases all the losses. So you don't have to look through them at them all fall. And you have as many colonies as you started out with. And then take those colonies and drop them back into my battery. So these are all the leftovers. They go into my battery and they are going to be used for next year. And my battery then carries through winter. So I hold them through winter in these nice little uh, nests. The reason why I get asked all the time, why don't I just fill them out to full size boxes? Why don't I run, you know, single instead of uh, running in these, run into these tight sixes or even those fives are even tighter. You're smaller and, and you have to put more work into them because you got to make sure they don't plug out or you got to make sure they don't starve. And the reason why I do it is because of the efficiency. It's more efficient to keep a smaller colony like this than it is a bigger one, right? And the other reason is I'm not putting enough, or I won't be putting in the same amount of medication into them. I'm not be putting in the same amount of sugar into them to get them through winter and the time and space within my winter shed. Like I didn't build my winter shed big enough. Should have built it twice the size I have it right now, but I'm working with the space I have. So I got to fit more colonies into a tighter space. So it's all about efficiency. But the other reason is I don't want to wear that queen out, that first year production, just filling out that single where I all I want is that colony, a nice viable colony to get through winter. So then I can use it to grow into a viable colony next year. I don't want to waste that queen that first year. I want her to spark up for me the second year. 
So just to round out the presentation here, um, the sustainability within this region, because there are tight time constraints, requires kind of a shift of a management strategy. And to do that, what I do is I focus internally. I cut my dependence off outsourcing. I keep everything internal as much as I can. And that helps me cut costs. It's a shift towards a two-year program. Um, instead of taking losses or assuming losses, I embrace my loss, you know, embrace them. And by doing that, I try to identify these units before they fail and become a loss and shift them in, salvage them into a nuke. I develop a battery of nukes and I focus the development of these nukes um, around queering, queen rearing at the absolute best opportune time I can up here, which is that May, June period. So I'm not trying to pre press the boundaries and building out these units exactly when they need to be built out. And by building out these nukes and maintaining them throughout the season, we're capturing operating costs by producing honey. So it's an absolutely brilliant strategy. It's something that's revolutionized my honey farm and has brought me right into, the, into pure profit year after year. So with that, I'd like to hand it back on to you, Etienne. I don't know if I run over my time, but uh, if there is time for questions, I can take one or two for you. Yeah, no, there's uh, plenty of time. But uh, if you've got questions, folks, you can put the questions in the Q&A. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just go through the Q&A really quick. Yes, yeah, I have a question for you while you're... Uh, go ahead. Uh, um, when you early on in the show, when you had a singles getting strong, you put the second uh, uh, brood box on them to pull off a nuke. When you pull that nuke off, how do you find the queen? I don't find the queen. I've, I quit finding the queen a long time ago because finding queens are a waste of my time. I hardly ever look for queens now. Um, other than if, if that colony throws a flag, I'm going to go down and inspect that brood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I bump into her to see what kind of condition she's in, but I don't find queens anymore. When I'm stripping off that nuke, mm -hmm. um, I'm shaking the bees down into that bottom box, excluder, back up on top. The bees Okay, that's how you find her. That's, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's how you isolate her. That's what I meant. Okay. Okay, so there's uh, one question around curious about strategies for outdoor overwintering of nooks in Northern Ontario. So Lake Superior, uh, I overwinter my regular hives double deeps outside. I use insulated tops and wraps, but uh, never overwinter nooks. Do you have any experience overwintering uh, nooks outside? Um, I don't, but I have neighbors that do. Uh, Northern Ontario, I think you'd be just ideal for indoor wintering, you know, set up a little wintering shed um, and you can, shift your nukes into that a little you don't want to shift your uh productive colonies but shift your nukes in there and you'll find it a very interesting addition to your wintering strategy but i do know guys that winter nukes outdoors up here and what they tend to do is instead of just running the one box they double it up so it just provides a little bit more food and maybe that colony sets itself up just a little bit bigger to be able to maintain itself through uh, very cold winters Sounds good. Uh, let's see. The next one is what is your frame composition of your new nooks, your ratio of nooks to full hives? Nooks to, oh, okay, I see. Yeah, I'm trying to target that one third. You know, it'd be nice if I had one half, but uh, one third of uh, my colony numbers. So if I have a thousand hives, I want 300 nukes as my battery to be uh, sifted into my operation. And I guess for your nooks, uh, frame-wise, like uh, empties, uh, foundations, drawn comb, honey, what's your composition of, uh, say, a five-frame nook or a six-frame nook? When you I always, that? yeah, I always count that on frames of brood. Uh, so I like to make uh, two frames of brood, a uh, frame of honey, of course, for food, and then I have a frame of a foundation just to be able to provide that bulge. If they don't have enough space and don't get to them, they can have a place to put that energy. If I don't have enough comb, I'll have two frames of foundation in there. That seems to work. I'm not really focused on those nukes producing honey. I'm wanting to maintain them. 
and I'm just providing the opportunity for them to produce me honey. So I just use the equipment I have and then fill the rest in with foundation. I'm just going to jump in quick. Have you on the swarming for your nooks, do you find that the five, six frames is enough to, uh, to keep the queen uh, laying? Is there enough sales to keep her busy? Absolutely. Uh, I'm building these nukes um, in June. You know that magical time of the year, the solstice, where the bees kind of shift their mindset towards hoarding and stuff. These nukes are fresh queens built in, you know, late spring into summer. So by the time they become laying viable queens, um, it, we're already into summer. By the time she fills out that little box full of brood, they're already in the backside of summer and they're not thinking of swarming. So I very rarely ever have nukes swarm on me because of that, because they're fresh and they're built later on the season. They, come, they seem to be on that backside. And some of these nukes are absolutely packed full of bees. Like you'd be surprised why they don't swarm off, but they're directing all their attention towards the brood in the bottom. And as long as they have place to put that honey flow coming in, take it up as long as we don't plug that nest with honey in the bottom as long as they have a place to put it they don't i haven't had a swarm issue at all with those nukes great uh meta yeah a quick uh, question ian uh, good presentation what's your uh, in summary just your uh, uh pest management program for your hives what do you treat for and what do you use yeah that's a really good question medhat and it's something i like to stray away from because uh, and I will answer it, but uh, everybody's circumstances are different, right? <laughs> I'm a northern beekeeper. I have this huge brood break and allows me opportunity that maybe some southern beekeepers don't have. And they're wondering, Ian, how are you getting away with one treatment per year, one or two treatments per year? I have to treat like four times. It's because my situation is a lot different than theirs, right? Um, but what I do is these hives come out of winter. They come out of winter, basically broodless state. I'm dropping Apivar in there and I have that first treatment period when I first take them out of the shed to the first bit of spring. So I'm focusing on that chemical treatment. It's been working for me. Uh, I go through uh, summer into fall and I'm assessing, assessing, assessing. I'm watching as that winter nest emerging to see how many mites are coming out of the brood to see if I need to take immediate action. This last fall I had to, I had to drop uh, uh, Apivar in there again. Uh, just because I just had an explosion of uh, mites come out of that brood and I had I had caught it and I was able to kill those mites off. Some years I don't have to, right? So if, if I don't have to, then I don't. But then I wait until just before I put them into the shed when the bees naturally become broodless or basically broodless when all those mites are exposed and I use an oxalic acid vapor treatment. And I use that as my mop-up treatment. So it, it uh, catches everything that maybe um was left as residual and by doing that i've found like i've talked about in 2019 i had a heavy loss and i caught it with um, oxalic acid my apivar was becoming ineffective that time i could not my mite counts kept escalating ever since i've been incorporating that secondary treatment and this one is oxalic late in the season my apivar has been working again so it's been it's been like that until this last season this last season is the first time i had to treat for the chemical treatment again in the fall. So take that for what it's worth. That's what I'm doing within my operation. It seems to be working very well. Uh, for brood disease, like, uh, are you asking about bacterial and such? No, I'm mites? talking about uh, yeah. Nizema maybe, because Nizema is very prevalent in our part of the world. Yeah, I don't know what to do with Nizema. I'm always like a man of assessment. I'm always watching my Nizema uh, infections. And I used to treat with the, uh, the product is available and uh, you know i'm always watching and how the treatment's working and i have these little silly farm trials mm -hmm. and there's absolutely no consistency with my treatment so i stopped treating and ever since i stopped treating i've had the lowest number of nosema like they, i've went into nosema or went to winter with hardly any nosema in my hives uh this fall i've and i've never seen that before or back Earlier when I was treating, I've always had like 25 million spore counts. And I even used Randy's sequential sampling just to help figure what the hell's going on. But um, I don't know, maybe Randy knows what's going on. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm just tracking and, and I don't treat for it anymore. Okay, thank you. Thanks, man. Just a couple more questions. Uh, have you ever dealt with A and B? 
Um, Have you, you asked me? Yeah. Oh, um, I don't see a, a lot of it every once in a while. It's like 15 years ago, I had a uh, one of maybe little, I bought hives from a guy and I brought in the infection and the inspector said, hey, look what you got going and it caught the problem. So I burnt it. But ever since then, uh, and then I was using uh, antibiotics because I was scared. But for the last, um, I forget when I quit using, now we're strictly on surveillance and we're looking and looking and looking and I haven't seen it. We're seeing European fowl brood. Um, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, basically in the stress, more stress years, the cooler type springs, we're seeing more of that. And if we have to, we'll use an antibiotic, but uh, we're trying to stay away from it. And I think our hives are healthier for it, but I haven't seen American fowl brood for quite a while. I, but I do rotate a lot of comb out of my uh, brood chambers. And I think that might help refresh the nest. Just a couple easy ones. The next one is uh, easy ones you, are never easy. Exactly. <laughs> when you put your nooks to bed, like to your shed, what are you looking for for frames? Like they they've shrunk the nest. The, the person saying honey, pollen, brood, brood, honey. So how many pounds of honey do you put in your nooks? Fifty what pounds. You, yeah, 50? I like to go into sheds and singles at ninety to one hundred. Nukes are exactly half that, or depending on how many frames you have in there. You have five frames will be about 50 pounds of total hive weight. And the sixes will be an extra frame. So there may be 60 or something like that. Yeah. All honey frames. Pretty I much. pack them right full. Yeah. Exactly. They're going in as boxes of bees. Um, and then we're holding them for, we're not going to get them out to April. So I got to make sure there's enough space or enough food in there uh, to be able to get them out. Cause I don't like feeding in the shed. Okay. Last question. Do you have any genetics? It says, what's your, for your area, what kind of queen has done the best for you? So I'm assuming it's genetics. Or... Yeah, I used to buy all my queens in from everywhere. So I bought them in from Hawaii, bought them from Chile, New Zealand, lots from California, bought queens from local. Um, I shifted my whole strategy. I've quit outsourcing. And I manage all internally now. Um, and I think I started with a good stock. Some of my breeders I initially started out with from Kona. So those, that's good stock from Kona and the Oliveras. And, and I'm incorporating Saskatraz in there because I just like to support the program. And they're good bees that do very well. With everything internal like this, I've noticed um, the bee get very, they're getting dark. So I think they're kind of going more of the conservative traits, maybe more carniolian type. Uh, they're becoming very calm and docile so you know maybe they're relieving some of the aggression because it's too cold up here and uh, <laughs> uh, i don't know canadians are happy and aren't they <laughs> it's a cold yeah. that does it to it <laughs> <coughs> but i think it's uh we've i've tossed out most of maybe that broodiness of the italian traits or so and it's drifting towards the more of the Carniole and maybe some Caucasian. We're seeing some red in there. I'm colored blind, but Carrie can see the red coming out in some of the queens. So. Sounds good. It. Uh, I'll thank you again, Ian, for doing this. It's uh, much appreciated. Great talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, there might be some more questions, and we'll 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 see. Uh, yeah, well, I, I definitely appreciate the opportunity. Uh, it's a lot of fun talking about bees. I could talk about bees all night. It's just what I love to do. And and I think everybody's kind of the same way here, too. Just want to get more and more of it. So maybe once we get through this whole awkward Zoom, actually, you know, Zoom has been quite an interesting thing because you were able to reach more beekeepers this way. Just I'm getting very tired of talking to screens and I can't wait to get back to conventions and actually sit down and drink some beers with some beekeepers again. So that's coming again, I think. I hope so. Okay, have I, a good uh, night. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So I'll just uh, introduce our next speaker. So Cayman has been keeping bees in north central Tennessee for 18 years and keeps over 300 highs with his wife, Laurel, full time. <coughs> Excuse me. Cayman and Laurel have uh, filmed hundreds of educational videos to help new and veteran beekeepers around the world keep their bees successfully. Uh, though Cayman does 99% of the talking, uh, Laurel has been beekeeping for 13 years, uh, was a beekeeper prior to their marriage, and is an invaluable part of their business, Tennessee Bees uh, Limited. Uh, they specialize in quality bee genetics, pure Tennessee honey, and honeybee education, 
and most of you likely know that came in also has his own YouTube channel and uh, yeah, please uh, visit. So with uh, with that, came in. Uh, I'll let you share your screen. The screen is yours. All right. Can you hear me? All right. Fantabulous. All right. Good deal. Share the screen. Oh, God, forgive me. I am. My wife is not here, and she's the tech buff. So. Let's go slideshow. And you all cannot see that yet, can you? Nope, it's all good. Okay. I can see it on my end. Apologize about that. Nope, we see it on our end. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Now if I could just get it to move. Oh, I see what I've done. All right, give me one second. Go. So Laurel and I keep our hives here in Tennessee. It's quite a bit different from Ian and definitely you, uh, Etienne. Uh, we, but we get a very consistent amount of rainfall and we have a lot of blooming plants still in summer, but we still have a pretty significant dearth. And that's one thing I want to talk about kind of have a saying here and I am if I can get this slide to work can you still see what I am looking at or is that gone at the end uh no we see your screen so I think if you try clicking slideshow again all right there all right go. this time it's moving fantastic all right Good. uh so let me back up just a hair because the YouTube thing was totally not my idea. I really hate technology. I mean, it's, it's great. I love that there are people who understand it and who utilize it to make things better. I am not one of those people that understand it. And so my wife uh, kind of forced me to do some YouTube videos. We, we felt like there was a, a need here locally for some information that was for Tennessee. A lot of the best information at the time and still a lot of the best information comes out of you know, Randy Oliver's in California, many of the researchers that are on here are from other locations. And of course, Ian was doing some great videos and still does, but that was in Canada. And some of my favorite researchers um, somewhat nearby are still pretty far down south. And so we wanted something that was more localized. And uh, that's why we got into the videos. We found over time that there were three key things that really helped change our business into, well, really what was not a business into what now is a business. And that was great queens, dead mites, and good nutrition. This is a picture from one of my honey production yards earlier um, of June of last year. And just out of this yard, for us, this is a, a good crop. We produced over 3,500 pounds of honey off of just a little over 30 colonies. So for us, you know, with no uh, canola flow, we uh, definitely were excited by that um, crop right there. But it takes a lot of things coming together in order to get that. And Randy Oliver, who was um, or may still be on here, I remember when I was struggling with nutrition, and I didn't realize it quite at the time, but I was under the impression talking to a lot of beekeepers who had been into beekeeping in Tennessee longer than I have and had um, that there was no reason to ever worry about really summer nutrition. As long as they had enough honey, things were fine. But I would split bees in July or August, and in some falls, we don't get much of a flow here. The goldenrod doesn't get enough rain or, or whatever it is in the other plants as well. And those splits would not build up properly. And But the big colonies would still, as long as the mites were taken care of and they had bee bread and, and resources. They would still go on just fine. And so as we were trying to figure things out, Randy Oliver's information on nutrition and feed supplements and stuff really helped us dial in that, whoa, we actually have a dearth almost all of July and August and in a rougher year, a decent part of June. And if we don't get much of a fall flow, then, you know, we just get a trickle in September and it's green and it's lush, but that doesn't mean that there's available forage out there. So it was really eye opening to see, okay, a lot of the locally held knowledge 
does not work here. So th this is a picture of me teaching my kids to graft and my daughter is on the right hand side and I just wanted to include this because I mean, it really is the future of beekeeping and I hope both of my kids in some form or fashion uh, want to do a little beekeeping, maybe a lot of it, that would be nice, but if they're anything like their daddy, they'll want to do their own thing. <laughs> So Kathleen on the right actually grafted queens last year when she was eight years old and um, out of a, a graft of 30 cells ended up with a, a little under a dozen um, queens to take from that. So I was, I was pretty proud. That was her first shot. And uh, she's a, uh, they're both quite the helpers. Great queens. This is something that, again, I had to learn uh, a lot the hard way. Great queens really can make a you know, colony pop. And without a great queen, you're not going anywhere fast. It doesn't matter if you have low pest problems, if you have great nutrition, if your queen is subpar, then you're, you're not going to be able to produce those big honey crops. Uh, lesser queens um, typically just, uh, you know, just don't get it done and they'll just sit in those hives and, and just take up space all year long. We have a short flow. And I think a lot of people have, you know, you have a, a short window. And so for us, about the first or second week of April to about the first week of June. That's our honey flow. And if we want to make a good crop, we have to have a great queen coming out of winter ready to go to town. So I learned that we needed to requeen a lot of colonies throughout the year and make a lot of splits and really keep in that um, youth and vit vitality in our operation by making splits and requeening colonies. And I've over time realized how much that I, that queen cells are a really important part of our operation. These are some queen cells that we actually did in a video. And we, we made these with a five frame nucleus colony. It's very strong, probably about seven bees of density in that five frame nucleus colony, all nurse bees, two frames of bee bread, frame of foundation, obviously the graft frame and a frame of honey and some very, very thin syrup, a little under one to one, about three quarters of a pound of sugar to one pound of water and we can raise a you know a decent small bit of cells like this and this is how we started queen rearing was with this technique and this is what we recommend to a lot of smaller bee clubs or small beekeepers who like to do it for themselves because raising high quality queens in smaller batches with you know great nutrition this is exactly what i love to see in a queen cell right here is a lot of royal jelly up top and you know a nice elongated fat cell that shows that they really got a lot of attention um, per cell. And I think maybe a little over the top, there's a lot of debate on what a queen cell should look like. Um, I'm very happy with the way these ones look. So this kind of ties a little bit into the queen rearing and also the nutrition. This is something that took me a while to learn. And again, we're going back to Randy Oliver, uh, having some pictures and information in the American Bee Journal, talking about the jelly down into the cells. And there were some other teachers um, throughout bee literature and other things that I learned that from. And as a new beekeeper, I think this isn't um, stressed upon you enough on how important that jelly is down in the cell and what kind of indication that is on the flows that are happening, the reserves of bee bread that the colonies have. And I think initially a lot of us, you know, we're told honey, 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 but we're really not told a lot about pollen and a lot about that some pollens really aren't adequate by themselves and that there are periods of dearth. And so this right here is, is what we look for anymore when we get into colonies is how much jelly is down underneath those larvae that they're able to um, feed upon. And of course, when you're grafting queens, having a nice pool of royal jelly like this is, well, it's, it's wonderful if you're trying to graft because you're really not grafting the larvae so much as you're picking up the jelly and just um, placing it down in there. It makes it much easier. Oops. So this is August and August is right in the middle part of our dearth. And I know compared to um, a Western dearth period, it's, it's crazy because, and that's, I think that's why it's so hard for Tennessee beekeepers to grasp that there is a dearth in many places in this state. It is not a complete dearth. There'll be tiny trickles of pollen, but it's not near enough to sustain a colony that does not have reserves from spring. But you look at Tennessee and it's lush and it's green. However, there's just not a lot of healthy pollens. It's, it's very hot 
and just tr it's trickling in. But this was a colony that had plenty of bee bread coming out of the honey flow. It produced a good crop. After it was done, we used a double screen board and split the colony into half, one deep below, one deep above. And then I dropped a cell um, below and above. The queen was just looking a little bit, um, a little bit peaked. It's where we use around here. And both queens came back. And this is just the top box right here. And so for us to see something like this in August, this really excited me because it's hard to get frames like this for us in August. And it's really going to set these colonies up and did set them up to go into winter really good. Now, obviously, having low mites was a big part of this as well. This is back when I was using Apivar. I haven't had as good of fortune with Apivar as of the last couple of years, but um, when Apivar was working extremely well for me, um, I would make those splits. I would drop a queen cell in, drop the strips in, and it, it, it was awesome. You kind of got your cake and could eat it too. You could get your great queen, you got your dead mites, and then we would feed pollen patties, small amounts. We had to watch it with the small hive beetles. So right here is one of our starter colonies for queen cells um, that we use for our operation. Uh, we teach the five frame nuke method because it really is a nice way of raising queens for a small hobby or small business. But this is the way that I like to raise them. It's basically swarm-like conditions. And obviously there's many techniques of this, but it's just our queenless starter. And then I'll have some finishers that we will take the, the graph bars to. And then after a certain period, we will put them in our incubators. So the mites obviously is, is a huge one. This is one that still is the big issue for us. The, the is extremely frustrating and we're very thankful that, you know, Randy and other guys are, are doing the work that they're doing, tinkering around with different formulations um, of control. And actually uh, I just, myself and a friend of mine, um, Richard Brickner, uh, talked to the EPA here in Tennessee day before, well, no, today's Tuesday, so yesterday. And we are seeing if we can get an exemption to use the sponges, the same dosage as Randy is doing them to see what kind of results we can get. Um, I will say that I have not ever done that before, but there are some people that I do know that have used them <clears throat> in Tennessee and said that they like them very well. So I'd be curious to see if, if we can get that exemption, we'll be testing 30 colonies. 15 as a control and 15 with the uh, the product but the mites is a huge one and right now we've been using apigard oxalic acid during a brood break in december and we've also been using apivar um, but now we've kind of been switching things up because i just have not been seeing good control with apivar in my personal situation we produce a lot of mites and like ian said it's very different from location to location on how many mites your bees produce and so I'm really excited about the future. I see a lot of men and women who are pushing towards bees that do seem to have a little bit more of a tendency of keeping the varroa populations down, even though we don't fully understand all the mechanisms. And I do believe that there are men and women who are looking into more controls um, or techniques and or just understanding, you know, hey, this oxalic acid vapor, it does not do what we thought it did when we first had it made legal in this country. I mean, there's a lot of us. And that's, that's one of the things that excites me as well, is that we're communicating a lot better. And this is exciting for smaller beekeepers, because it seems like a lot of times for the really good information to get all the way, all the way around the, oh, the, the circuit, it can take years. And there are people who are still to this day, treating with oxalic acid once a week for three weeks, thinking they're going to get good control with that. And that is not the case. Uh, I'll never forget when I did a five round in 21 day on a yard of 40 colonies expecting a 90% kill. And I didn't even average 65% across the board doing alcohol washes before and afterwards. So it was really eye opening that there's a lot of big question marks, not only on how to control varro Varroa, but which products are the best and which ones are actually doing what we think that they're doing. So this alcohol wash right here is one of the most valuable tools that I have. Um, two of the most basic tools that we all have or have access to is a calculator for a business 
and an alcohol wash kit like this. And both of those are very important um, in my business model. Ah, boy, don't you love to look at that right there. So I think one of the, the things that many of us forget in Tennessee that we stop raising so many drones in late summer and that mite population just goes right into the worker population. And in Tennessee, I don't know how many times I've heard in the last couple years, especially since my YouTube channel and emails have been flooded so much um, with questions, people losing their bees in October, late September and November, because the mite population, they think they have it under control, or maybe they didn't control anything at all. And the colonies crash. If you're wanting to have a successful hobby or business, I really feel like right now you have to be able to answer all three of these questions. Do I have a, a good queen in there? Better yet, a great queen. Um, what are my mite populations at? And what's the nutrition like in the colony? And when we say great queens, dead mites, and good nutrition, the dead mites really encompasses pest management. We just you can't say well, great queens, low nosema. Um, and go down the list of 40 other things. So mites kind of encompasses the management of good bee husbandry as far as pest control and monitoring um, any type of disease. Speaking of issues, ah, small hive beetles and feeding pollen patties. So this is something that I have been jumped on with both feet for many years. And it is a little tedious feeding pollen patties here in summer. Actually, I had some patties. I was checking them yesterday. And I, there was patties I was checking in February that had some small hive beetle larvae in them in February. So those colonies are quite large and they keep the patty very warm. And so they're, they're consuming the patty at a good rate. But I like to throw a good about pound and a half to two pounds on a strong, you know, nine to 10 frame colony. And there's a certain degree of it that gets wasted sometimes because of the small hive beetle larvae. And of course, if they can get out of the colony and reproduce, it's an issue. And in summertime, it's a bigger issue. So we will take a one pound patty and cut it up into four pieces. And it's, it's a big pain in the butt, but we just, we're trying to create surface area. And for a double deep colony, even with small hive beetles, if we split it up into a couple pieces, they will consume it fast enough where there's very little damage at all. And it's, it's acceptable. Smaller colonies get less patties. And a lot of it depends on the type of the patty. If I use like a man lake patty from that they've created themselves, I have to watch it a little bit more. It's a little bit harder. The bees seem to be a little bit slower at consuming it. Whereas if I use one that's made um, with syrup, the soft patty or something I make here at the house, that's softer, the, the beetles, the bees can eat it a lot quicker and the beetles aren't quite as big of a problem, but it's something, it's kind of an art form feeding patties in small hive beetle country. I, I really think it's valuable, especially in the, the falls like we had this year where we didn't even sniff goldenrod, which is unheard of. I mean, I've never seen that before. Of course, I've only been beekeeping 19 years, but there were some guys with 30, 40 years experience saying they've never had a fall this poor. So that's just part of beekeeping too, is monitoring, getting into the colonies seeing what things are like. Obviously, this is what we want to see. This is late March, early April pollens right here, hardwood pollens. And I mean, that's just a gorgeous frame right there. And of course, those bees are just powerful when they have that much resources. And that's, that's really where the bees come from right there. Honey's an energy source, but, but that's where all the, the goodies come from, proteins, fats, all that kind of stuff course here's a nectar shake right here that's the kind of nutrition that we would like to see this is the soft patty right here it's um much easier for the bees to i guess grab it with their mandibles i i'm not 100 percent sure all the ways that bees handle patties but they do consume it much faster than they, they would a manufactured hard patty in, in my opinion and then this is the last slide, and I just include this at the end to show that when we follow the principles of great queens, dead mites, and good nutrition, this is the result. It's, a, it's more work than you know it has been in the past, I'm sure. I'm a young beekeeper, so varroa and the pest problems like small high beetle, it's all I've known. 
it's something that we're going to have to deal with. And it's frustrating, but it's also exciting. I see a lot of collaboration going on. I see a lot of people who are, are getting into the industry and looking at ways to combat these issues in a creative manner. And the community is, is the exciting part for me. But you know, producing honey like this takes a lot of work. But if you have a great queen and low pest problems and good nutrition, this is the end result. And obviously, Mother Nature has to be a little benevolent to make that happen. But, uh, you know, as beekeepers, um, we're basically gamblers. We, uh, we just go for it and hope that uh, we don't lose our shirt this year. So this was a good year. So that, that's my presentation. If anyone's got any questions, I know you wanted to keep it around 25, 30 minutes and then take questions. If that's all right, Etienne, I can talk more on that. It's up to you. No, it's good. If you've got uh, other things to talk about, you're, you're welcome to, to, to oh, chat there. But uh, Oh, sure. I just figured maybe people uh, might be interested in like uh, you know, what kind of treatments we use. Yeah, pollen that's... patties, all that stuff. So let's, let's talk pollen patties here. Um, there's, there's several different types. Um, I won't this, so this won't take too long. I have used ultra B because they're pretty close to me. I, I'm in Northern Tennessee, not too far from the Kentucky border. And so Clarkson, Kentucky, which used to be Kelly's is owned by man Lake. And now that they have ultra B up there, I'm able to get it by the pallet and get pro suite up there. So that's, that's the main reason I use ultra B is, is price and it, and it has done good. Um, the last batch or so hasn't been quite as good. It's a little darker and the bees don't seem to eat it quite as quickly. Um, that could be just my observations, but, um, it does seem to be a little bit different. You can look at some videos I did three years ago and the patties definitely are a lot lighter to look at, but what we've been using of late is just buying the patties just to, for save saving some time however um, i have multiple videos on recipes on how to make your own and save some money there's actually a video i released about a week to 10 days ago and it's michael palmer's recipe tweaked slightly because as man lake changed the formula um, it, it changed how the consistency turned out but if you buy a 50 pound bag of that and get and can get sugar for a similar price that i can in the low 40 cent per pound range, then you can make those patties at home. And they're a really good patty um, for just about a dollar, dollar five cents a pound. So that can save you a good bit of money compared to you know, purchasing some instead, which especially in small quantities can be um, two and a half to four dollars a pound, depending on where you get them from. Uh, as far as um, treatments go, this is one that we're still dialing in. I like using Apigard thymol products. It's a little bit tricky and it's frustrating because I, this is one of the number one questions I get asked and I really push the whole treatment side of things being a former treatment be treatment free beekeeper um, years ago is that, um, you know, treat and monitor and, and do your due diligence and make sure those mites are low and Hey, whether the bees take care of the mites or something, else does. Maybe it's a treatment. They just need to be dealt with. Um, maybe a combination, which is what I hope to see more of the future as bees more resilient and a combination of treatments. But the Apigard thymol, I use once a week for three weeks using a lower dose, about 33 um, cc's um, as opposed to the 50 gram dose or 50 cc. I, I cannot remember if they have it in grams, but I'm pretty sure those both are fairly similar. But it comes with a syringe. We do 33 um, once a week. And I, I feel like that actually gives me better control um, with, the, with the alcohol washes I do before and and after um, than the 50. So, and doing that twice. Cameron, where are you putting the uh, Apigard in the hives? Um, we are putting it like if it's a double deep colony, then, um, well, even if it's a single, um, it'll go on top and we will have a shim to make sure there's plenty of airflow. Now, we put up an experimental yard this year, and, and please note that this is my first time through it, and so I wouldn't say that my data is, is worth even anything of significant note, but we did do alcohol washes beforehand and afterwards, and we did count all the bees and all the mites and, and did our best to uh, keep track of everything, 
And, you know, as, as years go on, I hope to get a lot better at that. And we still only got 79% on average control with the APA guard. But, but in the experimental yard, we did not do the three rounds. We, we wanted to go by what they recommended. So it was the two applications of the um, 50. And then the formic acid was only a couple of percentage points away from that. And I was really surprised by the oxalic acid the most. Um, we caged all the queens. Um, and we found that once there, all the colonies were broodless, we treated with um, two grams of oxalic acid uh, through sublimation. And we only got an average of 58% reduction, which shocked me. However, again, this is all very preliminary. preliminary. And then on top of that, um, we, we, we did give them a good bit of time for the bees to to brood up and then allow a generation to come out of the cells because I felt like if we if we took the test too early and this could be flawed thinking this is where I need some um, training and more experience but I felt like if we then released the queens after the treatment like we did and then took a test shortly afterwards all of the mites would be right back into the cell and if we did a wash then we would get a very low count so we tried to wait till after a a cycle um, had emerged after treatment to do the alcohol wash, but um, we're still learning a lot about that and following um, Randy's stuff quite a bit and um, some of the guys at the University of Florida and others. Um, yeah, I've been called a bee nerd before. So as far as treatments go, though, um, I, Formic is not used a lot here. We are tinkering with using it in the fall when it's cool enough, using the Formic Pro in October. And there are beekeepers who do that with success, but only a couple that I know of. They are very good. Everything's very timed. They're, they monitor their mites throughout the season and have other controls leading up to that point. But I think where most beekeepers in this area and maybe across the board struggle with Faroa is they buy into, well, this product is going to give me 90% control or 95% or whatever it is. I have not found that in real world experience to be a consistent thing to count on to where I can expect this treatment to give me 90% kill every year from year to year. So as um, a beekeeper, who's trying to keep, you know, a few hundred hives alive and, and productive, I can't trust any of these products. And I'm sure in certain cases, they did get 90% kill, but there's one thing that I find really fascinating is, you know, Randy's in a very dry climate, and then we are in a very humid climate, and there's different talk about how these products off-gas, like Formic and Thymol, and how that affects treatment, you know, so there's, it's exciting, but also really frustrating, so my, basically what I'm trying to say is for those of you who are treating your bees, don't wait to, to late in the season, because if you wait till late August and September, um, maybe you have to if you're up in Canada, that's different. But down here in Tennessee in the south, we treat our mites in June after we pull the honey supers. We get them off as fast as we can just so we can treat the mites as quickly as we can. And then we will follow up with an alcohol wash in August. And then typically we will apply some more treatment. It's just a, a matter of keeping the mites low all throughout the season with oxalic acid cleanup in winter time. So it's it's a lot of work, but the end picture of the cow and the barrels of honey is the end result of all that work. Good stuff, Gavin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks and for having I'd me. I'd say on. I've got a treat in me, just so you know. There's sometimes still snow on the ground, and I'm doing my first treatment. Because if I don't do that, they'll get out of control towards the end of the summer. But if I do it in the beginning of the summer, then they're probably good for the season. So what kind of treatment are you using, ATN, um, this time of the year? Oh, reversing rolls. Uh, so usually I'll do an OAV. I'll do a wash slash OAV just to get an idea of the drop because I've got mm -hmm. screen bottom boards on everything and I'll do a count. Uh, depending on the level, I'll do a retreat probably five, six days later because there's not that much brood. But the challenge is I, I create brood like next week, I'm going to put pollen patties on my colonies. Okay. 
so I can get two cycles in uh, before I even do my first inspection because I actually follow Ian's uh, queen assessment approach. Uh, because if I don't put the pollen patties now, I won't be able to do a proper assessment till mid May. But if I do pollen patties now, I'll know in April, mid April, when I do my first inspection, if the queen's laying, how good the pattern is and all that. And I miss out on that first treatment. But uh, just to, to jump back to you, just to finish, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, no problem, no problem. I, I use Formic Pro uh, as the, I guess, kick butt treatment. So if yeah, things get if things get out of control, and I see lots of mites in my drone, brood and all that type of stuff, I'll just throw in Formic Pro now, and and then uh, it, luckily. I don't have much of a mite problem. It's, it's, it's minor. It's, it's you just have a, you just have a winter problem. That's what you have. <laughs> it's a crazy winter you've got up there, man. Uh, yeah. You can have it too. Sounds good. I'll send you some snow. Uh, let's see. Let's see what the questions are. I, uh, let's see. First one. Do you use any traps for small hive? We do. Um, it's, it's a matter of really an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You'll never eliminate all the small hive beetles. The, the number one thing you can do to prevent big problems is to prevent slime outs in the first place where you get colonies that can literally have thousands to 10,000 small hive beetle larvae and they're able to escape out of the colony and then go into the ground and pupate. And, you know, within a matter of a couple of months, sometimes even less, they are back into adult form and into those hives and, and wreaking havoc. So the first thing is prevent that from happening. And when you see it happening, get some soapy water and dump them in there. Take the extra time to do it. Um, there are some traps out there that, that we use. Um, they don't work super well when you have pollen patties on the hive because the, the beetles want to go towards the pollen patties. They don't want those traps. So I'm thinking like beetle blasters, The um, you can put oil in there. I, I ran a small trial. It wasn't super scientific. It was just naked eye test and took a couple of colonies and put two beetle blasters in each one. One had diatomaceous earth. One had um, just some oil in there like they recommend. And honestly, both performed within like five beetles of each other on control. So on and each group, it was all pretty neck and neck and similar placement. And so you can go either way. I don't like the oil because it always gets stuck. And if you pry it up, it spills all over the colony or my bee suit. And it's usually rancid at that point. And then your bee suit smells for months and months. Or you pour it on your bees and they don't appreciate that either. The diatomaceous earth, though, if you get that onto your bees, then that's going to really cut them up. So those traps can help a little bit. There are the Dynamax um, towels that you can put in there and the beetles will pull those, uh, the, the bees will pull them apart trying to get them out and the beetles can get caught in there. But there really is a need for a better small hive beetle trap. And there are, there is a, something out there that is better than what we have now. It's just getting it to the market and all the regulatory process and stuff like that. I feel like that's a battle that um, we're in a pretty rough spot right now. Um, there is, there's definitely needs for some, some small hive beetle treatments in this area that really kick their butt but i'm tinkering around this year with putting some pollen patty down into the oil in the traps to help out and they, they do work but getting them early in the season is really the best option we have right now get I'm, i put traps in in february because really killing them in february and march is is more productive than trying to kill them in june and july when they they thrive and yeah, just get them early in the season, get them late in the season, but honestly trapping throughout the season. So, and then there's some expensive models that are like a hundred bucks a piece, but it's not worth it. So um, really keep your bees strong, kill them as you can. Kevin, there's a, you might want to try using propylene glycol in those traps. And I can't remember which researcher years ago evaluated all the different kinds of liquids to put in there and said uh, propylene glycol, um, which is all food grade and, and uh, so if it spills, it's no big deal. Let me know if you try it. I don't have enough small hive beetle to run 
do the control trials where I'm at. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I'm, no, that's um, you're lucky guy. With, but uh, let me know the <laughs> results if you try propylene glycol, and and because uh, I'm curious to have somebody use tell like somebody's willing to test stuff. So um, give it a try. Sure. I will. I'm um, definitely give that yeah, not, a try. Not ethylene glycol. That's toxic. Propylene glycol, uh, which is used in cosmetics and food. Okay. I will. Great. I wrote it down. <laughs> propylene glycol. Right. Easy. Uh, easy to buy. So, so it's very similar to glycerin. Awesome. Okay. I, th I thought it was similar to glycerin in some yes. like texture or whatever. Yeah. Awesome. I will give that a try. Yeah, and like I it has said, a different. It has a very different surface tension. So it uh, apparently works really well to grab the, the small high beetle. So you might even also, because it's water soluble, but you might be able to put a scent or a flavoring or something in there also. That's, that was going to be my next thought was where I was going is like, okay, could we, this is where it would be dangerous for some people do some like artificial peanut butter smell or something. The, um, you know, what you ought to do is uh, Peter Thiel did a bunch of work. And do you, Matt, do you remember, was it peach that he said? worked well it was either peach or i think it was peach that he said peach. was very attractive i'm not quite sure but actually if you get some mix of larva and pollen and mush them that's basically the early trial it was based on that okay. mush larvae and pollen together and that's what uh, makes the attraction for this mm -hmm. interesting that, yeah there is one trap in australia they call it epithor and that one actually, uh, I brought it here to Canada, but I did not have enough beetle to test them. It's in reality just to attract the, uh, the uh, beetles inside, and inside it has a, a active ingredient of one of the pesticides, and uh, it's quite good. Uh, according when I was in Australia, they showed it to me. This one is completely it's like uh, the CD cassette. And it's always sealed, so the bees will never have a chance to go in. There is one, a different version. You can open it up, fill it up again with the material, and put it back in the hive. Beekeepers don't like this one because the ceiling is not good, and the bees can go inside and get killed. So there is one product only I am familiar with in Australia. They call it Epithor, and you can uh, E P I T H O R, I believe, e something like. That. Mm. Good stuff. Yeah. This this is this is really um good stuff. I appreciate this. Um, I've actually offered on my YouTube channel a thousand dollars to anyone who can deliver a product that can human you know in in a way that's not going to be toxic to the beehives. Create a trap that will just blow them up, you know, as, as they eat it. <laughs> so it would be it would be wonderful. Um, good. Uh <laughs> Hasn't done. It has not been done yet. But that product in Australia, it works fine. But uh, you're right. Keep strong colonies and just try to manage. That's all. Yeah. So somebody's saying use the uh, your drones, your your mite infested drones to make that paste with the pollen to to put in your traps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go right. fishing. <laughs> Just before I uh, pass it on to Ian for his question, somebody have you used? Uh, pollen sub powder instead of patties. Is there a reason you don't use powder, or do you have a preference for uh, for patties? Is that directed towards me or to Ian? To yourself. Okay, so that is a question I get a lot because there are many who think that um, feeding dry sub is going to do the same thing that pollen patties will, which um, I I don't think it, it does. Um, that's just based off of what I see. Um, not necessarily what I know, um, what I, that's what I think I know, but when my bees this time of the year need that protein and fat content and everything that, that provides in there is, on, is during the bad weather weeks, those cold days or those, those weeks where we'll get just rain, rain, we get tons of rain here in the spring, tons. And so sometimes the weather's you know, 50, 60, 70 degrees, but it'll rain for six, seven days straight. Can't, bees can't get out and those colonies can, can be in a critical situation and I can have dry sub all day long but the bees can't get to it where that pollen patty is still feeding them and then on top of that as well this is one thing that really baffles me and maybe 
Um, one of you all who have a lot more knowledge of these things um, can explain this to a degree. But so I mentioned we have a dearth in late June, July, and August. We have very small amounts of pollen coming in. It's just a trickle, but it's not very nutritious. And sometimes it's just not existent. And I will sit out Ultra B and they will, you know, there'll be a handful of bees on it, just a, a little bit here and there. You know, I might have three to 400, which if I was to sit the same thing out in February or March, I, you couldn't even see what the container was. There'd be so many bees on it. And the only thing I can figure, because the bees would benefit from it, I can feed pollen patties and they'll eat it and it, I can see a noticeable difference, but putting out that dry sub, they won't ignore it. So the only thing I can figure is that trickle of pollen, keeping them from trigger, triggering on that dry sub. I don't know, but I see better results feeding patties over the dry and honestly the dry like there's beekeepers who will feed it here in november i was 76 degrees on christmas day they'll feed it christmas they'll feed it january and our bees really don't want to brood up here until the maples bloom in february and start producing pollen so i used to do that i just felt like i was burning through money and so i stopped feeding all throughout the winter. And you know what? I haven't noticed any difference. I, once the pollen starts, I'll, I'll, I'll say, oh, those maple trees are fixing to bloom. Pollen patties like a week before they bloom at the earliest. And if I time it right around that time, I, I, I get the most bang for my buck. So I feel like it's a tool for me that um, the pollen patties can give me a lot more than the dry sub. I just, I don't really see the dry sub doing a whole lot. Now, has, has anybody got any clarification they'd like to add to that? I'm Still trying to figure all this out. Come on, ATN. <clears throat> oh, I, I just use uh, real pollen patties or like with real pollen, the wet stuff, because uh, I want it in the colony because it's it's cold outside or whatever, and I need it in the colony so they can have access to it. Mm. And it's for raising brood and making winter bees. So I use pollen patty twice a year. So now in March, and then I use it in... Uh, late july early august when the rust spores come and we get our first frost and it's just to prevent the bees from bringing garbage into the colony but, randy uh, oh yeah i oh, randy. i've experimented a fair amount with the with the dry and you know like just like ian's pictures you know there's times when the bees will just mob it what i look at though is then you walk through your yard because when they're mobbing it when those foragers are coming back you can see it all over their bodies it's very easy to see at the entrance who's taking it in look at the difference from colony to colony. What I find is you may only have just a few colonies in the yard that are doing almost all of that foraging on it and other colonies aren't touching it at all. Then they, <laughs> I, I have used fluorescent tracers in it to show they, that the colonies that are gathering will take it in and they will make bee bread out of it. That makes it with natural pollen if, if that's coming in also. Um, and then I, I, I need to do much more experimentation, but I was looking this, this last fall wondering whether if I paid attention to those colonies that were bringing it in more than others, whether they were would be rearing more brood, and I didn't see a, a difference, but it was very limited. There were only a couple of colonies that were obviously bringing in way more than the rest. The the one possible advantage of it is that they the foragers put it right instead of the nurses having to move to get it, they do put it right in the middle of the the brood, which theoretically should be very stimulating to the nurses to have that pollen, that dry sub brought in and packed right in next to them. Theoretically, if, when I look at actual reality, I don't know that I see that so much. Whereas we put in pollen patties, it, all the colonies get it uniformly and they do, yes, immediately respond to it. Uh, so I'm curious about uh, Ian's observations on it. Ian? The floor is yours. Do you remember yeah, all you bud. <laughs> I kind of forgot the question I was going to ask you, Cayman, but <laughs> but Sorry. I'll say is uh, we do focus a lot on uh, dry feeding in the spring because like Cayman says exactly that, they just go bonkers over it. So if they want it and to keep it, the bees are the neighbor's yards. But like I've, I'm doing these silly little trials and I'm, I'm trying to see whether or not <clears throat> I could just focus on the, the dry and not have to do the patty feeding first thing in the spring because that's a lot of work to crack those colonies open and you disturb the nest you may they get cold so i tried 
just feeding that dry supplement in some yards and then feeding the dry supplement and the patties and the other yards. And the, the yards with just the dry supplement, they brooded like a one and a half brood frames or the ones with the patties on there were three, three and a half frames of brood. It was quite obvious that the patties were the better choice, even though they consume just as much of that dry stuff coming in. I don't know what that meant. I don't know. I think I sent Randy a, a, a question. I said, what the hell am I seeing here? <laughs> so I don't know. The question I wanted to ask you, Cayman, now that I remember what I was going to ask you, is I'm really interested in um, those uh, small hive beetles and this dance that you have feeding supplement, like those patties. How, how are you feeding the bees and not the beetles? uh in the spring or throughout the year what's what what do you do so that your hive doesn't just explode in beetles because i don't have any experience with them but i talk to beekeepers or do and they hate feeding patties because of the beetles in their colonies sure well as you all know that healthy colonies like to eat and so if you have colonies that are healthy um, you can put on a good size patty and uh, the main thing is creating a plenty of surface area on the patty and not allowing any more places than we have to, to have um, areas where the bees can't access and the beetles can't. So that's one of the reasons why we, our lids have that shim built into them. So it, it rises up above the patty a little bit more. So first thing is all about access. Um, one thing I've learned in the last year or so uh, from going from making um, a ton of patties by hand to then buying them by the pallet is that the patties that we made by hand were a lot softer and the, the bees consumed them faster. So yes, we, um, we don't have to make patties, which was super exciting because you know, my wife and I were making those by hand. And I told her, I'm, I'm like, you know what, this is ridiculous. We're going to buy a pallet. But the problem with buying the man lake ultra bee patties is that they aren't as consumed quite as quick as the stuff that we made ourselves. And so I know some beekeepers, you know, some commercial operators down in Florida and Georgia who are making theirs, and it's not quite as high in protein as what the regular ultra bee patties are, but since they're softer and a little bit sweeter, um, the bees eat them a lot quicker. And some of them are cutting them up into strips like I do if we feel like that's necessary. A lot of it is just a per colony basis, a strong double deep coming out of the honey flow with a good queen. I can still feed a good pound without any issue. I'll just cut that sucker in half so I can get a little more surface area and it's good, but smaller colonies will need less. And, and like I, I mentioned, those traps, trying to keep the numbers low. So it, it's kind of a, a delicate balance. And it seems sometimes um, that there are some colonies we do end up creating some small hive beetle larvae that, um, that end up getting into the ground and pupating, but it, it's kind of rare. It, it comes with a lot of experience um, dealing with it and making a lot of mistakes and learning what you can put on, what you can't put on. And, and whenever you see any issues um, with the, ma the main thing to control in them, in my experience is whenever we see colonies, even if it's a little nuke that's starting to, to get taken over, um, you know, shake those bees out. And if, and do not let a slime out happen because that's that's where you get those reinfestations into the yard that are just devastating. You could do all that work of keeping them low, and then you have one or two colonies um, take a couple thousand into the ground and then pupate, and then now the entire yard of forty or fifty colonies is crawling with those suckers again. So it's um roll up your sleeves and get to work. Fun, fun, fun. Sounds like a fun problem to have. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll send some up. There's no uh, repellents that you could put in the uh, the pollen patties that the, the beetles uh, don't like? So there is a product out there that is um, healthy bee. I believe it's called patties. They're um, spirulina based and have all kinds of essential oils. And I did try those very limited. I wouldn't call it an experiment, but um, as beekeepers, a lot of times like what Ian did, um, you, tr you try some things out and whether it's a flawed test or not, you feel like you've got something meaningful out of it. And I tried them over two seasons and I felt like, yeah, they, they did repel the beetles quite a bit. You know what? The bees didn't do very good off of them though. And so it's like the whole reason I'm feeding pollen patties is to get brood build up. Right. And these things were totally screwing up brood build up because they had so much essential oil in them. I think, I don't know if they were blocking pheromones, now, the bees did eat them, but it should, 
bees will eat anything if you put enough sugar on it. So um, just about, so I, I didn't find them useful. Um, the only thing I can think of um, as far as keeping the, the beetles away from the patties is just not having beetles in the hive in the first place. I just don't think that can help it. Maybe someone will come up with something legendary, but there are, there's a guy that's putting a wrap around them to where they get caught in the outer wrap and the bees can only get it from the edges, but that's too time consuming for a, a, an operation. And what concerns me is I see some of these products, like there are people who are putting entrances in their hive because beetles supposedly cannot hover and they fly like an airplane. That's what I've been told that they're putting these entrances that are reduced down to these like PEX tubes and these little entrances that the beetles have to fly in directly to get in because they stick out and they're just a round smooth tube. And they say that that works, but I could only see that working on a, a small colony because of the, uh, the ventilation problems. And I know some people who have tried that and they have their, their colonies um, burnt up or absconded because of the lack of ventilation. So it's, um, it's a complicated issue. One that again, I'm hoping someone will create a product that the bees can't get access to, but the beetles will be attracted to and kill them. That is kind of like, um, a bait that you could put in there that would be wonderful good randy okay have, have you tried um elevating the patties on a uh, queen excluder uh with a rim so that the bees have access to all sides in order to groom off the eggs of the small hive beetle i've heard of people doing that again i i can't do these experiments myself sure. but uh um that'd be something that um i'd love to hear from you if you give that a try too but i have heard success by doing that yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. And that is the biggest issue. So now that we've got the rims up top, um, bees are, of course, able to get access to the sides and the top and monitor that really good. And like you said, pull the eggs off. And good, strong colonies, that's one thing I failed to mention is they will go after the small larvae or eggs and yank them off. But it's the places they can't get access. And that, for us, is between the top bars underneath the patties. So, yes, maybe elevating them a little bit like that could be the ticket. I'll give that a shot this year. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I think that they're doing it. Uh, you could try it on the top, and uh, some beekeepers are they're also doing this with the oxalic strips, is um, putting it between your uh, two brood chambers, making a space there. Um, but at least for that uh, patty feeding, then you'd have it totally surrounded by bees that would be wanting to groom all sides of it. So might be worth a try. And I, of course, I love hearing results. So let me know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for sure. So. I, when you talked about the oxalic acid, would that be in regards to like the pads or the towels and basically allowing the bees to crawl up underneath and get more oxalic acid on them as opposed to being on the frames? Is that what right, you mean? With, no, laying them inside in between the brood chambers. Uh, one beekeeper um, who's been using them, uh, I assume with permit, very successfully um, on the East Coast, um, the way his, his supers and frames were built there wasn't quite enough clearance between the bottom bars of the frames in the upper box oh. and the top surface of the sponges. He, so he puts a quarter inch rim in there and that allows more bees to walk over the top surface of the sponges. And he um, feels that helps. I, I, I'm hoping to start some tracking experiments this year to see whether the bees are mostly exposed to the get exposure from the top surface or the bottom surface. The glycerin tends to go to the bottom surface um, more, but um, I need to do some tracking experiments. So that's, hopefully I'll be able to get them done this year and see. Good deal, we're all looking forward to that. So last chance for questions, folks. So if you've got questions, put them in the, so, in the Q and A. Cameron, I put the Oops. link for that EBSOR out there in the chat. Okay, I appreciate that very much. I'll, I'll do you a service game and I'll, I'll uh, send it to messenger to you. You're the man. Here we go. <laughs> I just copied it. So uh, just before we close out, any final comments, uh, folks? So thank so you, everybody. Someone said a question about hop guard um, that was missed. Um, I don't know what everyone else's opinion on that. This is what I've this is what I've been saying for the last couple of years, and um, I, it's not for everybody. But I felt like with Hop Guard, it was strike one, strike two, and now strike three are out. 
Um, I, I'm not sa saying that it's not for other people, but I did not like hop guard one or hop guard two. I didn't like the control. I didn't like fooling with it. Um, hop guard three. I don't know. It could be better, but, uh, there's, I don't do, does any of you guys know anybody that uses that on a regular basis? I'm sure somebody does, but I don't know any beekeepers around here that uses hop guard. Well, I did a lots of work in there, but you're like in terms of when we did use it and tested in the field, it was late in the season and we were able to get a good results. Good results. Uh, but the only thing I dislike about this product, two things, it's too messy. And the other thing, uh, the label is not quite clear. A lots of people, they see a lots of excess material in the bag. So they try to get it as much as they can on the strips and they put it inside the hives. And that really becomes, uh, it gums everything out. <laughs> the bees get stuck to it and get it in their body and stuff like that. So again, like what you said, you, we tried an experiment for a year, second year. And after that, just uh, we say, okay, it's good or bad. But that uh, later on, as you people use it in different locations, different regions, different systems of management, now it is not holding up. I, that's why I look at it. Mm. Some guys who's been using it and they love the fact it's organic and all of the stuff, and they kind of in a way try to understand the system. And it goes back to what he started with, as well as uh, Ian, and each location and each region and every details about your operation and your bees and it you have to consider that in the whole thing about mm -hmm. pest management don't look at one thing you're going to get you 95 percent all the time under any circumstances it doesn't happen when i tested it with the hop guard hop guard three is gentler on the bees than hop guard two is they've changed the formulation uh slightly okay. It is really messy, um, but when I did the uh, summer trial, um, it wasn't a 90%, but it was you know up in the 80s with repeated. So if there's brood, now I haven't tried it in the brood list as Medhat um, did, but that seems to be the um, probably the best uh, opportunity uh, to, to work it in. Well, sounds like something I need to try out um, with the Hop Guard 3, maybe an experiment this year. Um, always always learning something new um and like like Medhat said you, you you know trust kind of trust but verify it's basically what it is um where the alcohol wash really like i said the calculator and the alcohol wash um have really done more for my business than any two other expensive tools that i have ian's over there grinning um it's because we've had this conversation before i think but uh anyway you um, don't you feel so bad when you kill 300 bees? Well, we killed 15,000 um, this year doing it, counting all those bees out. And I had a whole new respect for researchers after that, let me tell you, because I knew it was going to be some work, but I didn't realize how much work count, separating all those bees out and the mites. Um, so yeah, I got a whole new respect, but I, I still believe that, man, we, we got a lot more work to do because I interviewed Cameron Jack a couple of weeks back and he, yep. he talked about oxalic acid and in their research that it's, it's not giving um, the control that, you know, we thought that it was, uh, as I say, we as a general beekeeping population and it was um, lower than I thought, you know, it was going to be. And so there's just a lot of questions out there and we definitely need answers. Beekeepers need questions. Now I know from a researcher standpoint, it's always exciting to have um, questions but my business, I need mites dead now. <laughs> well, I think uh, the problem with all of ours, and uh, I'm sure some of uh, who's researching right now, and uh, Randy, it's, you come up, you, you try to answer one question, but everybody tried to generalize that statement or that results for every sing single circumstances it can go through. It is not the case. Mm. Like, good point. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's, people need to understand their bees their seasonality and what's going around them and like what you said like those guys who likes to use the icing sugar for determining the mite i might run into now <laughs> a hornet's nest 
because they can like to release them and like to see them flying back to the hive. My question to them, have you ever followed them and see after that shaking the hell out of them, they are going to still survive or they have concussion in their head? Yeah. I may as well just kill them and know exactly how many mites I have. Then I can have proper way of determining the, where the mites is in my, my hive. I always say, I got the doctor, he draw a blood sample out of me every time I go for blood test. I'm still surviving, but they know exactly where I'm at in any kind of test. Mm. Yeah, so, the thing to put in perspective that I use is that in a, in a strong colony, you got a thousand bees a day dying of natural mortality every day, yeah. of natural mortality. That's such a, yeah. that's, that's uh, on, a growing, on a growing colony. Um, <laughs> what, uh, uh, Cameron, one thing you're going to see is I'm, I'm just finished uh, with prototype, my fourth generation of, of uh, battery powered portable mite wash agitator. And it's just incredible. I'm hoping to be publishing the plans for it for everybody to use worldwide. Um, I, it's, um, um, I have a design that can be made almost entirely off, off the shelf components. I've searched, <laughs> searched the internet, so pretty much an Amazon uh, supply. Um, I don't know if I'll be maybe putting together kits. Um, I'm trying to get somebody to manufacture it. I'm not interested in making money on this. This is just, this is not something I'm going to make money on. But it opens your eyes to your operation. When you have mechanic, when today we went out, when we did probably a uh, hundred mite washes, me and an assistant, you know, it's, um, it, for, for three people, it's less than one a minute. Um, so you can go to a yard of 60 in 45 minutes and have an, a mite wash count on every colony. You don't realize how blind you are to Varroa and to the outliers and all that until you start doing just massive high speed mite washing. So um, I think that it's really gonna be a game changer for a lot of beekeepers having these portable agitators out there. We love them. We've used nothing but portable agitators for a number of years now. Uh, we have a, a number of them. And um, my sons just love having that kind of handle on, on the Varroa levels in, the, in our yards. That is awesome. Um, can I ask one more question? I, I don't mean to run this over at the oh, end or okay, anything like ahead. that, but this, this is a, a great thing that you've put together. I, I know that you asked me beyond and I, I feel honored to be with these group of guys, but um, yeah, I, I'm just as interested to sit here and listen all night long. Um, so the CO2, has anybody, has anybody here tried the CO2 method? I, I use the alcohol wash because I, like Randy related to, yeah, we're losing bees every day. And so it's not the end of the world to sacrifice 300 to know exactly what's going on at the colony. But there is a large group, you know, I deal with, you know, tens of thousands of subscribers and we really push treatment and monitoring, but there is a large percentage that do not want to do that alcohol wash because they don't want to kill those bees. As, does anyone have any exper experience with the CO2 method and does it even come close to comparing to the alcohol wash? Do you guys know? I, I have experience. I published an article on my website. I've spoken with two other German researchers who also tried it, and none of us were impressed by it. Okay. Well, alcohol it is. Um, I know a guy who said um, how he does the alcohol wash is if he sees a mite in the colony, he takes a swig, and he keeps taking a swig until he can't see mites anymore. So um, that's the wrong kind of alcohol wash. <laughs> right. And we, we've switched to, we don't, use, we don't use alcohol anymore. We use Dawn detergent, which gets much better recovery quicker than the alcohol and much easier and cheaper to use. We use just the only carbon dioxide uh, for collecting mites for our uh, experiments for mite site testing. But uh, we never really try to use it. It's too expensive. It's not accessible in the field as like, you know, unless you have one hive or two hive and you have that small pump. But uh, to me, alcohol wash, it's good. Good stuff. And, uh, so I want to thank everybody uh, for sticking around. Uh, still 90 some people here. I think we, we peaked at uh, 120, 23, which is wonderful. Uh, again, thank uh, Hive Alive for their sponsorship of this event. And just about next uh, next session, next month, it'll be Tuesday, April 19th, and we'll have Dr. Karen and Julie Common from uh, British Columbia, one of our new directors, 
and they'll be doing, I'm just trying to read the screen, uh, urban beekeeping prospects and challenges north and south of the border. So Dewey is in Portland, Oregon, and Julie, Julia, excuse me, is uh, in BC, so around Vancouver. So it'll be a urban for urban beekeepers and some perspectives on that. 